All right, uh, welcome to lecture two for CS 182, 282. In today's lecture, we're going to go over some basic concepts in machine learning, which in later lectures will connect up to deep learning. So let's start off with the first question. How do we formulate learning problems? There are a number of different problem settings that can be tackled with machine learning, and we'll go over uh, one of the canonical categorizations next, although there are definitely other categorizations. So perhaps the most commonly studied uh, machine learning problem is the problem of prediction. Given some input x, predict some output y. For example, if you're solving a classic linear regression problem, you have uh, x corresponding to the position on the horizontal axis and y corresponding to the position on the vertical axis, and then this problem could be solved with something like linear regression. But the same problem formulation applies to much more complex and higher dimensional inputs, like the image classification example that we discussed in the previous lecture, where you want to predict the label uh, of the object that is present in the image from the image itself. So maybe you would like an image classifier that determines whether a picture contains a dog, a cat, a giraffe, or a hippopotamus. Uh, so your labels are dog, cat, giraffe, hippopotamus, and your input x is a, an array of pixels. These are all supervised learning problems. They're referred to as supervised learning because uh, they are supervised with ground truth labels during training. But this is not the only kind of learning problem that exists. You could imagine a different kind of learning problem, which at first might seem a little bit abstract, but we'll make it more concrete shortly, where you start off with unlabeled data, meaning you don't have uh, tuples of x and y, you just have x's, you just have maybe pictures from the internet. And you would like to somehow analyze uh, those inputs to uh, learn some sort of representation uh, or some kind of categorization or clustering of the data to basically figure out something about the x's themselves, which could be perhaps useful for downstream uh, learning uh, for prediction. This is referred to as unsupervised learning. And if this seems a little bit abstract for now, don't worry about it. We'll talk about it in a lot more detail shortly. And then the third category, at least in the canonical categorization, is one where uh, we would like to learn strategies for interacting with environments. So in supervised learning, our goal is just to predict a y from an x. Uh, in this uh, next category, our goal is to actually control an agent that has to take sequential actions. So this agent is going to output an action and it's going to observe the consequence of that action from the environment along with a reward signal that tells it whether it's doing well or poorly. Now, you could imagine, for instance, that this is a robot that is learning how to perform some task, or maybe this is a, an ad placement agent that is trying to learn what kind of ads to place uh, to get the largest monetary return. This is referred to as reinforcement learning. It's referred to as reinforcement learning because in this setting, the agent learns from reward signals from positive and negative reinforcement rather than directly from ground truth supervision as in the supervised learning case. So we'll talk about this more shortly. So let's uh, define supervised learning uh, a little bit more precisely. We're going to assume that during training, we are given a data set, which I'm going to denote with a script D. This is also sometimes referred to as a training set. And the data set consists of tuples of x's and y's, where the y's are the true label that corresponds to that x. So if we wanted to actually solve that image classification problem, what we would do is we would collect some pictures of dogs, cats, giraffes, and hippopotamus, and then we would have probably humans go through each of those pictures and label them with their true label. And that would be our training data, which we would use to learn how to classify new pictures. So the goal in supervised learning is to learn some function uh, f theta of x, and remember theta here denotes the parameters, so it's theta that is actually learned, and this function f theta of x should be approximately equal to the true label y. So again, this could be for the linear regression setting or something more complex like determining the category of objects in a photograph. Now, there are a number of questions that we have to answer to actually instantiate a supervised learning method. We have to choose how to represent f theta of x. So remember, in machine learning, 
This f theta is just a program. It's a program that reads in x and outputs a guess at y. So we have to choose what kind of program it will be and how the parameters theta will enter into that program. It could be something as simple as a linear equation. This would be the case, for example, for linear regression. It could be some polynomial regression function, or it could be something more complex, like a neural network, which is what we'll study in this course. We have to choose some way to measure the difference between f theta of x and y. So uh, the issue here is that we're going to be selecting the theta so that f theta of x is as close to y as possible. But we need to select a notion of similarity, a notion of closeness, because initially f theta of x will output values that are very different from y, but we somehow need to improve theta and we need some way to evaluate whether one theta is better than another when both of them might make lots of mistakes. So in continuous settings, this could be the square of difference between uh, f theta of x and y. It could be something called the 0, 1 loss, which is a number that is basically 1 if f of x is equal to 1 and, and 0 otherwise. Um, it could be something more sophisticated involving probability, and that's actually what we'll talk about later on in today's lecture. And then we have to figure out how to find the best setting of theta. We need to actually find we need to actually design an algorithm that will modify theta to get f theta of x to be as close to y as possible for the x, y tuples in your training set. And this is called an optimization algorithm. There are many choices like random search, gradient descent, least squares, and so on. And we'll talk about uh, one particular choice again in today's lecture. All right, so that's supervised learning. Let's talk a little bit about unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning at first might seem a little abstract. We're saying well, we're going to take unlabeled data and we're going to produce a representation. That's kind of weird, like what's a representation? In supervised learning, everything was very clearly defined. You just want to take an images and output correct labels. Here, it doesn't seem as clearly defined. So what does this mean? Well, one uh, way that we can formulate an unsupervised learning problem is as a problem of generative modeling. You might have actually seen examples of generative modeling before. Perhaps you haven't heard the term. Um, but for example, uh, you could imagine a, uh, a model, a generative adversarial network, or GAN, that constructs pictures of faces. You might have seen this in the media, uh, some really cool, very realistic faces of people that don't actually exist. Right? A neural network can sort of dream up a face. Um, it can also dream up uh, animals and things like that. So these are all outputs of generative models. They are not real images. This is a neural network that just constructed an image. This neural network was trained on unlabeled data, because if you just want to learn how to construct images, you don't need any labels or categories. You just need lots of images. Now, of course, those images all have some common structure. They're not just random noise patterns, so all the pictures of dogs contain dogs. But the generative model doesn't need the labels. It will just produce images that resemble the images that it was trained on. A more formal way of, of, of saying this is that the images that were provided to the model came from some underlying distribution. So there's kind of, you can kind of think of it as a, a continuous space of all possible human faces, and the photographs that you provided for training came from that continuous uh, set of human faces. They were sampled from that set. And then the model is supposed to reconstruct the set, potentially producing faces that it didn't see, but that are still realistic faces. Generative models need to acquire representations of the data in order to solve the generation problem. So somewhere inside of the model, there are representations that model parts of faces like noses, eyes, hair color, and so on. And in fact, quite a bit of work has looked at pulling out those factors of variation and using them for various downstream applications. So examples of generative models, GANs, VAEs, pixel RNN, and so forth. And we'll actually learn about many of these uh, later on in the course. Another really big uh, area in unsupervised learning, especially today, is what is sometimes referred to as self-supervised representation learning. So self-supervised representation learning doesn't aim to generate pictures or sounds or uh, sentences directly, but rather it aims to acquire the representations without direct generation. Uh, one very uh, high-profile and important example of this is language modeling. 
So some of you might have heard about the BERT language model or the GPT-2.2 or GPT-3 language models. Uh, the GPT-2 and, and GPT-3 models are actually generative models, but BERT, which is the model that is actually most widely used in industrial NLP applications, is not a generative model. So uh, it does solve a kind of a prediction problem. The particular problem that it solves is it actually takes a sentence, um, deletes some of the words, and then tries to predict what those words were. But that task itself is not actually what's useful. The task is just there to force the model to acquire meaningful representations. So it's the internal representations of language that the model acquires that are useful. And those are then used for downstream applications, including machine translation and sentiment analysis. The same principle has been studied quite a bit in computer vision. Uh, for example, this is a slightly older paper that um, uses a self-supervised objective. The idea is that you take a photograph and you crop out two patches from the photograph. So maybe you had a picture of a cat, and you cropped out an ear and a nose. And then you ask the model to predict, how were these two patches located relative to each other? So if you just showed a picture of a cat face and a cat ear, uh, you know that that's uh, the right ear of the cat. So if the cat is facing you, it would be to the up and to the left of the face. But making that prediction correctly requires you to understand something about the structure of images and what cats look like. So it's not the task itself that's useful, it's that this task forces the model underneath to acquire a meaningful representation of images, which can then be used to solve other downstream tasks. All right, so if this all seems a little bit abstract or a little bit uh, peculiar, um, that's okay. The you know, unsupervised learning is definitely less straightforward than supervised learning, but we'll talk about it a lot more later on in the course. And lastly, uh, let me talk about reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning has a more complex formulation because reinforcement learning is not about predicting labels from images, it's about behaving in a certain way. It's about agents uh, that exist in a temporal process and they have to take actions in that temporal process and observe the resulting consequences of those actions over uh, a longer time period. So the goal of the agent in reinforcement learning is not just to take the best action now, but to take the action that leads to the best consequence in the long run. So now your function uh, takes in what's called a state. So I'm going to call, denote it with S here instead of X, but the same principle, it's, it's an input. But that input now has a subscript T denoting that it is a particular point in time. And at every point in time, it will have a different input. And then it out produces an output, which here I'm calling A for action. And the goal in reinforcement learning is to select those actions that lead to the largest rewards. You could imagine, for instance, an agent that is playing chess. There are many moves in chess, but the reward only comes at the end when you win or lose the game. Interestingly, reinforcement learning actually subsumes or generalizes regular supervised learning. You can formulate supervised learning as a special case of reinforcement learning where the reward is large if you get the correct label and small if you get uh, the wrong label. And there's only one time step. Now, it's actually harder to solve that problem than it is to solve the original supervised learning problem because in the original supervised learning problem, you're provided with knowledge of what the labels are in the training set. Whereas a reinforcement learning agent trying to solve uh, one of those problems would have to attempt different labels through trial and error and figure out which one is the correct one. So essentially, reinforcement learning methods could in principle solve supervised learning problems, but that's usually a harder way to go if you actually have supervision. So in supervised learning, you get f theta of xi to match yi. In reinforcement learning, you get f, f theta of st to maximize a reward, which could be anything. The reward might not be to match a particular yi. It could be, for example, to win the game of chess. And there are more than, there's more than one way to win. You could uh, think of some examples of how particular problem settings can be formulated as reinforcement learning problems. For example, uh, if you're training a dog, the dog is solving something that looks like a reinforcement learning problem. Its actions are the movement of its muscles. Its observations are its senses, sight, smell, and so on. And its reward is perhaps the, the treat that you give it. Um, you could imagine a robot learning to perform some task, like running as fast as possible. So its actions are the motor commands to the robot's motors, uh, and its observations maybe are camera images or whatever sensors it has, and maybe its reward is some measure of task success, like is it running as fast as it could. 
But you could also imagine other types of problems. Like, for instance, you could imagine a logistics problem, a problem of uh, choosing inventory levels in warehouses for a, an e-commerce company. Here, your actions might correspond to which inventory to purchase. Your observations might correspond to the levels uh, of the goods in the warehouses. And your rewards might correspond to the profit the company is making. And that's also a perfectly valid reinforcement learning problem. Here are some examples of uh, actual reinforcement learning agents. This is actually what I work on in my research, so I have a lot of videos of these things. This is a robot learning to walk with reinforcement learning. And of course, the video is sped up. This is about two hours into the process. But you can see it starts off not knowing how to walk and then gradually figures it out from experience. Um, some of you might have heard about AlphaGo. That was a reinforcement learning system that learned to play games of Go. Although it didn't learn by playing against other humans, it actually uh, learned by playing against many copies of itself in simulation because it needed so many games uh, to be played in order to master the game of Go. But there are also many other applications besides robots and games. There are applications of reinforcement learning in education, recommending which topics students should study next, making recommendations, for example, YouTube, uh, ad placement, healthcare, recommending treatments to patients, anything that can be formulated as a sequential decision-making problem where you don't have ground truth supervision. 